Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comics and I'll let you know what I thought about them. But before we get into that, I want to say thank you so much to everybody who voted for us. We won the CBC Award for Best Comic Review here on YouTube. That was awesome. The Comic Book Community Awards. This was their second year. They announced the winners last Saturday, and we won Best Comic Review. And this was the first time that this was a category. So this has been going on for two years. Brian LCS has done a fantastic job of putting this together. Members of the community coming out, throwing in nominations, throwing in votes and it all leads up to this and I could not be more proud of this and the community that we built up here at Pop Culture Philosophers around the weekly comic book review. We've been doing it every single year for over six years, every single week for over six years now, and we don't have any plans on stopping. So thank you to everybody who voted for us. Thank you for all the people who nominated us, and thank you for everybody who watches. And Brian, you're doing a kick-ass job. Excited for what's going to happen next year at the CBC Awards. So on behalf of everybody here at Pop Culture Philosophers, thank you so much. Station. There you go. Now on with the pick of the week, because we always start with the pick of the week, and this week's pick of the week is All Against All, issue number one from Image Comics. This is written by Alex Pagnadel, with artwork by Casper Wingard, and lettering by Hassan Ansman El Howe. I loved this book. Now I got to read this a little bit earlier, right? Really sink my teeth into this. I've actually read this several times, right? We had Alex on the show probably about a month ago. If you missed that conversation, definitely check it out because we talk a lot about this book in particular and other pop culture and comic book related things. It was a great conversation. I had to get the Spawn cover because Image is doing these Spawn covers, DC's doing these Spawn covers, and I'm like, you know, we could all use a little bit more Spawn in our lives, but all against all, is about this race of alien beings. They're kind of like jellyfish, like space jellyfish, but they have to they have to exist in a body. And they make their bodies from other organic life forms from other planets. So years after humanity has been wiped out, we're destroyed, we're gone, they are now operating Earth kind of like a, a biome, right? Where they're where they're a biodome, where they're like uh, they're like trying to figure out these different animals that they've cloned and recreated and they're trying to put them in these environments and figure out what parts are best to use and all this kind of stuff. This is a really good book, right? There is one human in that habitat and when they go in thinking that they're hunting him, it turns out he's going to be hunting them. So it's it's really interesting, a really cool approach to the story. Alex did a way better job of explaining it uh, when he was on the show, but it says... To those they once conquered, they are known as the Operators, invasive parasites capable of controlling the bodies of other species. However, their galaxy-spanning civilization is now so advanced that living hosts have been replaced with expertly curated designer bodies. Nobody remembers the old savage ways, but now the Operators are under attack by a far mightier civilization and they are losing, so they must once again seek out strong bodies amongst the stars. The artwork by Casper Wingard is amazing. Everything Casper does is freaking fantastic. The style shifts and changes to the appropriate tone. This one's got a raw, visceral edge to it that really amplifies some of the intensity of some of the scenes. The color choices are top freaking notch. Like, absolutely wild, sophisticated, supremely cool, and top-notch excellent lettering from Hassan Altman El Howe. This is what a comic is like when everybody's working at their peak, they're working at their peak together, and they care about putting out a high quality, high concept, and highly valuable, entertaining concept. This was a great book. I loved it. All against all, the pick of the week. Also from Image, we have Hexware number one. Once again, a Spawn cover here for me. Um, Hexware's all right. It's the new Tim Seeley book. It's in a world where magic and technology kind of exist together. Um, there's this android, and then there's this girl who dies, and she's trying to bring the android, or the android's trying to bring the girl who died back. So she starts learning all these pagan rituals. 
and it leads to this thing. It was interesting enough. The artwork is is okay. I mean, it's got some good pop. It's got some good flavor. It had a good concept. It didn't 100% super suck me in, but maybe I'll come back and see what happens in issue number two. Then we got the final issue of Do a Powerbomb. That's issue number seven. Once again, Spawn cover. Uh, I mean, come on, a Spawn Do a Powerbomb cover. I mean, come on. Uh, this is the final issue of one of the best miniseries of this year. Daniel Warren Johnson has done an abs absolutely sp spectacular job here of telling an extremely dynamic and kinetic story, but at the same time having it feel very heartfelt, tragic, nuanced as well. I love that that's something that Daniel Warren Johnson can do. The artwork is... Freaking, it will leap in your face. I've said it before. This book grabs you by the throat, throws you into a chokehold, does a power bomb, just takes you out. It does what it does, and it does it visually, and it also does it emotionally at the core of this story. So in the final bit, they have their final match here. It's against God. So this is our two main characters versus God in the best match they, we've seen so far. This was awesome. I loved it. Thought it was really great. Then we got Little Monsters number eight. Once again, Spawn cover. Uh, Jeff Lemire, Dustin Wynn, doing a fantastic job on this kitty vampire book, right? Now, when I say kitty, I don't mean that it's about cats. And I don't mean that it's about young children. But it is. But it's not for young children. Anyway, it's visceral. It's got a nice edge to it. But it's about these kids who were vampires, or they are vampires. They have been told by the people who turned them... Don't leave beyond just this block. Don't feed on people, all this kind of stuff. They're starting to wander out. They're starting to feed on people. They're starting to have conflict within their own group. And we are now starting to get more and more of the past and the characters fully realized in the pages of this book. Great artwork from Dustin Wynn. He's doing like this digital duo tone type thing that I absolutely love. Great black and white artwork and some really great moments. Uh, Jeff Lemire. Only Jeff Lemire can do. Then we got Bloodstained Teeth, another vampire-centric image book. This one by Christian Ward and Patrick Reynolds, Heather Moore, and Hassan Osmanel Howe. I've had a lot of fun with this book. I've had a lot of fun with this book, actually. So it's about a world in which vampires exist, and vampires have this, like, secret council. They have all these rules to keep everything in check, right? One of those rules is that you don't turn humans into vampires. But there's this one dude who turns humans into vampires for profit. He's been caught, and he is now being tasked to kill all the people that he's turned. So on this journey, he's dealing with his own kind of guilt. He's kind of dealing with his own flaws. He's dealing with his own faults, right? So, and the artwork is freaking splendid. There are a lot more elements that are coming to play here. We're world building out into this council, into some of these other people. This book, the artwork is very realistic and it could almost be stagnant, but it's not because it's actually paced really well. And then the colors in particular really help this book pop. It's got a psychedelic edge to it. I absolutely love it. Then we've got Spawn, once again, with a Spawn variant cover. Uh, Spawn 336. Had a lot of fun with this one. Um, more about the revelations of Sin's past. Sin, of course, we used to know as Cogliostro. Now he's Sin. Now we know that he's a former uh, biblical figure. I don't know if we've, if that's been revealed before, but it reads as new to me. And then there's another character that's introduced. I, anyway, there's some biblical stuff, connections to to Cog here, to Sin, that uh, I really liked, and I liked it a lot. And some cool medieval action and all that kind of stuff. Moving some pieces around a little bit. It seems like Spawn's been kind of like in setup mode for a while, and now it feels like we're getting some revelations, and we're starting to get some more action, and it's starting to kick it up a little bit, and I'm excited to see what's going to unfurl in the pages of Spawn. Then we got Kaya here. I didn't notice if this one had a Spawn cover. If it does, hey, red eye, that's Red Eyes Teeth, that's Violator. Spawn cover, just kidding, it's not. Anyway, Kaya is a great book from Wes Craig, uh, Jason Wordy, and Anne World Design. I love the art style. It kind of feels like a really sophisticated animated film or something like that. But it's about this girl protecting this younger kid. <clears throat> I can't remember their siblings or not, but they're with this lizard clan. Each issue is one and done, but it's telling an overarching story. This one, they're up against a giant spider. Great, fun, light fantasy, but still with a little bit of gravity to it. And amazing artwork. Super awesome artwork from Marvel. We got Dark Web number one. This is the start of the Zeb Wells Marvel-centric event. Spider-Man-centric Marvel event. 
Going along with the other Spider-centric Marvel event, which is the end of Spider-Verse, more on that later, but Dark Web is a one-shot that's going to unfurl out in the pages of Amazing Spider-Man Venom and Gold Goblin. There's going to be a new Mary Jane Black Cat that ties into it, a Miss Marvel that ties into it, the X-Men. It's basically Ben Riley and Madeline Pryor. They're both clones. They're both clones who feel like they've been wronged, and now they are attacking with basically kind of like a a sequel to Inferno, in a way. Um, it's all right. Adam Kubert on the artwork. I really like the artwork here. I love seeing the Kuberts do artwork. Um, still so consistent and classic in 90s, and I, I love it. I love it so much. We're still adapting into today, right? Um, that being said, the story was okay. I'm not on board with Ben Riley as a bad guy. I've not ever been on board with Ben Riley as a bad guy. Seems like there's some weird stretching here. There's some nice bits. Like I said, I like the artwork. I think it's pretty solid. It's decent enough. Amazing Spider-Man's good right now. Zeb Wells' run is up and down, though. It's a bit inconsistent, and I think this is going to be one of the story arcs I'm least interested in. I really like that Tombstone and Hobgoblin story, though. Then we got Miles Morales' Spider-Man, a brand new number one. Some of the best paper quality we've gotten from Marvel. In fact, you got a really... It's not like a cardstock cover, but it's thicker. And the first few pages and the last few pages are good, too. And then they kind of get back to decent enough paper there, but I wanted to point that out. Um, so this is a brand new Miles Morales Spider-Man number one. Spends most of the issue catching you up on who Miles is, his world, the fact that who are his parents, where does he go to school, who are his friends, what's his relationship status, what does he do as Spider-Man, what's his motivation, what is his internal struggle, who are his villains. All of that gets expertly introduced to new readers here in the first issue. It may seem a bit like too much too fast at times, maybe, if you're a new, new, new reader. But I think it does a great job of just bringing you into his world, introducing everything, and then setting something up. And one of the reasons why I think it does it so well, because the artwork is freaking awesome in this book. It is superhero comics at their best. It is Marvel energetic comics at their best. Big open spaces, wide movements, big splashes. Really cool, fun stuff. Being able to see Spider-Man do the things that we want to see him do. Spinning around, but doing it in a very interesting and highly charged visual way. I loved the art in this book. I thought it was absolutely amazing. Marvel is starting to... Marvel's starting to kind of come up a little bit, man. I've, a lot of books recently have started blowing me away with the artwork at Marvel. So this is written by Cody Ziegler, and it's pretty solid. And the artist... I do want to make sure I get the artist's name. Man, look at that, though. It's just freaking awesome. God, that's like what it felt like when you were a kid opening up some of those Todd McFarlane pages. It's uh, Vincentini, but I don't know the first name. There it is. Federico Vincentini. I really like this one. I thought it was cool. Then we got Extreme X-Men number one. This is a new miniseries. It's a sequel to the early 2000s run of Extreme X-Men by Chris Claremont and Salvador La Roca. So that's what this is. It's the exact same team. If you liked that book, you will like this book. If you didn't read that book, I don't know if this is going to be the book for you because it is 100% a follow-up to that. Like, it's right there in that time. You'll be re really confused if you're reading this if you think this is like a current modern continuity X-Men book. Um, but it does also kind of pick up on some threads from, from Kitty Pride and Wolverine, which we covered on Marvel in the 90s. I'll eventually clip that out. Artwork's not bad. It's decent. I, I did like some of the references it was making to the past, but Extreme X-Men was not quite my jam then. And it it's still not quite my jam, but it's all right. Then we got Thanos, Death Notes. This is a one-shot comic from Marvel. It is written by several people, including Gronbeck, uh, Cantwell, and J. Michael Straczynski, and Kyle Starks as well. It is a few different Thanos stories. There is... A framing story, a framing sequence written by uh, Gronbeck, who is now the current writer on Thor for a little bit. I think Cates might be off of Thor. He may be coming back at some point. But Thor comes out this week. We'll get to that. The framing sequence in here sets up the Thor issue. But it's not really necessary. I actually read the Thor one first, and I was like, ah, oh, okay, so I need to read that Thanos one first. Then I read it, I was like, ah, I didn't really need to. Anyway, Gronbeck was also the writer of the most recent Mighty Thor and the ba Jane Foster and the Valkyries or whatever, so a lot of stuff is dangling from that, which I didn't finish that one. Anyway, so the framing sequence sets up what's going on in Thor. Then it's got a story kind of set right after the first appearance of, uh, of Thanos, and it involves um, 
It involves basically uh, Tony Stark interrogating the Thanos robot. Then it has a story kind of around the time of the preamble to the Infinity Gauntlet, and it also reveals some stuff about Thanos' past. Then it's got a story uh, by Kyle Starks and Ron Lim that's just kind of badass and set, like, just, I guess, a few years ago. Some nice classic Ron Lim type stuff there. So all in all, it was all right, but it, it didn't really feel, like, super necessary, but I think they know that Donny Kate's not being on Thor right now. They want to they wanna build up into the idea of this Thanos stuff because... We do have the promise of that vision of Thanos, and that's what they're kind of getting to here. Um, I would like to see Donny Cates do that, but unfortunately, he's not on Thor right now. Um, so, Legacy of Thanos. Nick Klein is back. Gronbeck is the new writer. It's Torun Gronbeck, I believe. is. I think it's a, I think it's her. I'm not sure 100%, but it's all right. It's, it doesn't have the energy and badassery that the Donny Cates Thor has had. But it is kind of setting up this idea that Corbius Clave is there. He's trying to find this black infinity stone that we've seen Thanos have in that vision. Thor is trying to investigate this vision. And it leads to some interesting stuff. Good revelation at the end. So it's not something where I'm like, okay, Kate's is off, I'm off. I'm still intrigued to see how this story is going to develop. Then we've got Fantastic Four issue number two. The second issue from Ryan North. And the second issue that I really like. I really like it. First of all, Ivan Coelho's artwork is pretty cool. Um, I was not quite so sure about the idea of doing these smaller stories. Ryan North said he's doing smaller stories at first to reintroduce everybody to these characters, kind of do like a, I don't know, like a Twilight Zone type episode structure or something like that, um, and focus in on the characters and then build up from there. So in the first issue, we have Thing and Alicia doing their thing, and there's there's this alluding that they're doing to of the, the Baxter building being destroyed and something's happened and people are blaming the Fantastic Four and all the money's gone, all the technology's gone, all this kind of... We've been there, done that, but that's where we're at. So we're building up smaller and slower. In this second issue, which is standalone, one and done, even if you missed the first issue, you could jump in right here. Um, it's Reed and Sue. They're eating dinner together at a diner and it turns out the diner is... They're all doom bots. And so why is this town mostly populated by Doombots and it unearths and actually without an, even an appearance by Doctor Doom, it actually says something so true about the core of the character of Doctor Doom and Victor in here. That thought was really great. Also a great spotlight on Susan and on Reed. Right, right now, Ryan North is doing a good job. Doing a good job. Then we got Punisher here with issue number eight. Y'all, I'm loving this book. I freaking love Jason Aaron's Punisher. I love what it's doing with the character currently by being the leader of the hand, the beast of the hand. He's going full into it. And I this story's not quite going in the direction that I anticipated. And I like that because it feels fresh. It feels different. It feels new. But it's also kind of recontextualizing some things about Frank Castle and even his wife, Marie, who we don't really ever know too much about. We know a lot now about her, him, their relationship, their family, and then just all this stuff building up with the hand right now. I am just here for it. I am loving it. The cat wants out, so let's let her out before she disturbs something. Also from Marvel, we have Daredevil number six, Chip Zdarsky here on Daredevil. And uh, the artwork is Raphael Le de La Torre. This time, that is the truth, and I, I'm pretty sure, but the artwork still works for me. I know in the last one, it was Marco Cicchetto. He just wasn't credited. The, the credit was wrong. But I'm liking this. This is Matt Murdock. Him and, and Elektra, they're married now. They are running the fist, which is like supposed to be the good guy version of the hand. They're trying to do the right thing, but still build up an army. So this is kind of like Matthew questioning things going on here, but also trying to connect with some of these former criminals and build an army with them. But I'm liking what Chip Zdarsky's doing in the pages of Daredevil right now. It feels epic, even though it does feel like a slow burn. It's got a nice pace to it that I'm enjoying, and things seem to really elevate in the pages here, especially towards the end. Very excited for some of those, the way that that stuff's going. Then we got Spider-Man number three, Dan Slott, Mark Bagley, end of the Spider-Verse number three, it's all right. It's just chaotic Spider-Verse type stuff. I love the Into the Spider-Verse movie. I don't really like the first Spider-Verse story. I don't like Spider-Geddon. I just never really got into them. I never even really finished many of them. 
And it's going to be a struggle to finish these ones because I just don't care about all these other spider characters. I just don't care. Like, I was, I thought it was interesting, some of the stuff they were pulling from the Straczynski run with the wasp chick and all that stuff. I thought some of the new ideas were interesting, but it's just kind of, it's just, it's all right. It's all right. If the Spider-Verse shenanigans are your thing, that is totally going to be your thing. Then from Dynamite, we've got Gargoyles number one. I've been highly anticipating this one. Uh, Greg Wiseman, the series creator of Gargoyles, is back to do a, a proper follow-up. So that's what it is. It spends most of this issue trying to introduce the world and the characters of Gargoyles to new readers while at the same time um, letting us old-school fans of the show kind of re-familiarize ourselves with these settings, with these characters, with these stories, because they also throw in a lot of Easter eggs and references to stuff that we've seen in the past, right? That being said, I really liked it. I thought it was written pretty well, and I loved the artwork. Now, this is a uh, Cambodias, I believe, is his. I don't. I probably said that one, but it's George Cambodias. Uh, I think. Anyway, I've seen his artwork on books where I didn't think it quite fit the tone. It fits the tone here, even being as animation feeling as it is. It does capture that darkness too with the colors. I really like this. I thought it was cool. I had to pick up the J. Lee cover. So I think if you're a Gargoyles fan, this is a must read for you. You're really gonna like that. Sink your teeth into it. Then from DC Comics, we got Batman 130. This is the end of the failsafe story. Great artwork all the way through by Jorge Jimenez. Uh, a decent ending for Chip Zdarsky, though I think he takes a couple of cheating little... He cheats a little bit, I think, at the end. I just didn't necessarily like the very tail end of this, ta of this story. And the whole first third of this, with how we resolve the cliffhanger from the last one, I, I'm into some far-fetched... Batman stuff. That Batman can do this just because he's Batman. I don't know, Chip. You're pushing it on that one. You're pushing it on that one, but Jorge made it look great, so I'll buy it for a little bit. Then we got Batman and the Joker, the Deadly Duo, issue number two. It's an alright story. Basically, someone has kidnapped Harley Quinn, so the Joker wants to get Harley back, so he kidnaps Gordon in order to coerce Batman into teaming up with the Joker to find Harley Quinn. So that's what's going on, and it's interesting enough, and the people that are, like, kidnapping Harley Quinn are these, like, mutated Joker freaks, but the real highlight of this book, and the pull, and the draw, is amazing artwork from Mark Silvestri. We don't see a lot of work from Mark Silvestri anymore, but he is showing us that he still has it, and he's probably still one of the best artists of the original Image Founders. The line work in here is insane. There was a black and white local comic shop day edition that they did of number one. I want a black and white edition of every single one of these. I love Prianto's coloring, but the 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 ink work by Silvestri is insane. We need black and white editions of every issue of that. Or at least a collected edition. The Joker, the man who stopped laughing, issue number three. It's all right, it's decent, but once again, it's a Joker story. When we are oversaturated with Joker and Batman books right now, it's a Joker story that doesn't feel like it has much in, as far as stakes go. See, the last one, James Tynan, felt like it had a lot of stakes, but ultimately seemed to lead to nothing, right? This one, it's a decent enough story. There's two different Jokers going around. What's up with that? It's got a nice quirky sense of fun about it that I appreciate, but once again... I cannot justify a $6 ongoing Joker book right now. That being said, it's okay. It's okay. Then we got Sword of Azrael issue number five, the penultimate issue by Dan Waters, doing a fantastic job with the character of Jean-Paul Valley, doing some of the best work on that character I have ever read, ever experienced, and really brings it to a, a crux in the fifth issue here, especially with the introductions of Jean-Paul Valley with Father Valley, which is kind of like his long-lost adopted brother that he never knew about that Rom V introduced in the Catwoman run. So really cool to see them together. Uh, Sismegia does a great job on the artwork. It is allowed to be introspective, philo uh, philosophical, and uh, psychedelic, and action-packed. It has some really, really great moments and some really new concepts playing around with the lore of like Saint Dumas and maybe there are other orders that have other angels that they're trying to embed into somebody's personality, right? Then we got Poison Ivy issue number seven. G. Willow Wilson picking up Poison Ivy now as an ongoing series. It was originally intended to be six issues, but it was selling decent enough that they went ahead and made it an ongoing. So what do we do? In this one, pa uh, Pamela's still on the road 
And she's now dealing not with a new threat. She's dealing with a threat that spins out of what has been going on for the previous six issues. But I rather liked it. I thought the artwork was solid. And y'all, I'm really into this Poison Ivy book. It's an interesting path to take. At first, I was a bit critical of this book because I thought it was trying to tread that fine line of making her like heinously villainous, but also like on a path of redemption and and honorable and and likable. And they, Wilson's kind of nailed that boundary and I really do like it and I'm really digging the book and the artwork especially when it gets to go like florifically psychedelic is awesome so there you go Gotham City year one number three the best issue of this series yet first of all Phil Hester and uh, Eric Gapster are doing amazing work on the artwork here and then you have Jordi Belair's coloring and I love a really powerful monochromatic comic and scene and some really great comic book work do, being done here and some great coloring work is what I meant to say. Um, but I like this story. So basically, it's like, I think it's Bruce's grandparents or great-grandparents, their daughter's kidnapped, Slam Bradley, uh, Gotham City, private detective. He has to figure it out. It's very film noir. It's very 40s. It's very cool. It's It's... I like it. I like it a lot. And I think it's getting better and I think it's getting more solid and I think the artwork was top notch in this issue especially the coloring and the just the every bit of the artwork was awesome in this one and the story is kind of taking this it's getting subtly more dark until it gets obviously dark i really like it gotham city year one that one's really sold me that was the best of that yet dark crisis war zone is a one shot that is not essential reading for your enjoyment of dark crisis it has a few different uh Short stories in here, they're all done by different creators, and the idea is in this big final battle that's going on at the end of Dark Crisis, these are just little vignettes, right? Just little bits, right? So the first story is about Linda Park and Iris Allen, and I thought that was fine. That's by Jeremy Davis. Uh, and so it's basically like, if you like the Flash book right now, you know, check that one out. Then we've got, um, we got a Spectre story. Every crisis event has to try to set a new status quo for the, uh, for the, for the Spectre, and they usually, half the time, just take it back to the original. That's what they're doing there. Uh, there's a Wonder Woman one here that I thought was just okay. Uh, and then there's a Red Canary story where she meets Black Canary for the first time. That was interesting enough. And then there's a Green Lantern story with Joe and Guy, and it was just alright. So, not really essential, and I didn't really dig too much of it. And then we got Frank Miller's Pandora from Frank Miller Presents. This is an $8 comic. It's going only it's only coming out like quarterly. So the next one's like in in like February or something. But all these Frank Miller Presents comics have been $8. Ronin Book 2 was well worth it for me. Not so much Ancient Enemies and not so much Pandora. Pandora is interesting. It's decent. It's an idea developed by Frank Miller um, with other writers kind of coming along doing the scripting here. And then we got Emma Kubert on the artwork. And I did think the artwork was fine. I thought it was decent and and interesting enough but it's about this like i don't know there's kind of like this fairy tale underworld thing going on and then it's about this this young woman who's dealing with the life that she finds kind of tedious and boring uh and then she meets this this dude who seems like he's a little weird and off and she kind of falls for him it seems like he's from this mystical underworld for a really big giant chunky issue it didn't really do much to establish its world or anything like that. And I found the narrative to be a bit confusing at times. So I like the artwork. I like the quality of it, but it just didn't capture me. So it really didn't. Then we got Know Your Station from Boom Studios. This is by our friend Liana Kangas, Sarah Gailey, and Rebecca Nalty. This is some of the best work I've seen in comics from Liana Kangas. I think she's a tremendous artist, but her comic book work here is the best it's been in my opinion, and that's highly aided by the coloring of Rebecca Nalty. I think it's a pretty cool, cool looking book. And the story is basically this. In the future, uh, there's now, what do they call it? They call it the, uh, oh, what is it? It's not the escort, it's the, the resort. The resort. Anyway, so the resort is this big, like, basically think of a cruise ship, but in space, right? Maybe the, they do this, like, kind of cheeky little fun thing here where they're telling us why all these rich people are out in a yacht in space and it's because they've destroyed the planet but they act like they haven't done that and so 
it does a great job of introducing you to this world. But anyway, it's basically a big cruise ship in space with a bunch of billionaires. And this is, it sets up the world of this ship. And then the woman who's like the security liaison, she's not like a, like, set up to be like a hard-boiled detective or nothing but a murder happens a really gnarly murder happens this dude gets flayed like skinned alive like some hellraiser shit right and now she's thrown into this and it's going to involve all this like these this political stuff i really liked it at times maybe the writing kind of just got a bit stiff but it did keep its flow going maybe at times unevenly but all the way through i enjoyed this book and i really really dug the artwork especially the coloring and the line work from liana then we got behold behemoth issue number two issue number one made my pick of the week as i'm reading this i'm like wait a second how do we get from there to here and then i remembered the ending of behold behemoth number one and then the ending of behold behemoth number two ties back into number one and then I'm like, ah, so I'm starting to make that connection. Anyway, Behold Behemoth number two was excellent. I thought it was really, really cool. The artwork is super solid. It's beautiful. It's wide. It's expansive. The coloring is absolutely phenomenal. I love the, the page design and the composition. Um, so artistically, it is great. And story-wise, it's great, too. It's got a nice flow to it. It's introducing new characters, new concepts. This is a world now in which has giant behemoth monsters that show up. And now this dude has this young woman, this young girl, and he's having to protect her. But she is, in actuality, one of these creatures. So that's what's going on. And and the first one, I remember having a lot of emotional stuff to it. A lot of, like, a lot of good, like, stuff that, like, brought you in to the stories with character-wise, right? This one does that but it also really has kicked up the action and i thought it was a really solid issue from dark horse comics we have it's only teenage wasteland this is from kurt pyers jacoby Sal salcedo mark dale micah myers i really really liked this one this is slice of life teenage youth that's what this is they it rings true the voices all sound authentic the friendships seem true but it's about this group of friends they're not the outcasts they're not the popular kids they're the ones that as kurt pyre says in the script fell through the cracks i i really felt that i understood what what we were digging on here i i get it and one of the kids parents goes out of town so they're having a party uh there's bullying involved it's it sounds like it's typical and cliche but it felt fresh it felt new it felt relevant and it felt like Kurt Pyers really knows what he's discussing, what he's exploring here. And the artwork was super solid, got the job done. And I really appreciated this slice of life from a teenager's perspective. But then there's a big twist. So you're getting the slice of life thing. And then there's a big twist. And, and I really liked it. It's only a teenage waste. Or it's only teenage wasteland. Really cool book. Also from Dark Horse, we have Night of the Ghoul, issue number three, the finale. Love the artwork by Francisco Francavilla. Thought it was amazing, especially some of his color choices. Loved it. Loved some of that composition and the design right there. Love the art in this book. Story-wise, it's okay. It's the idea of a lost film. This dude's trying to solve the mystery of what is this lost film, Night of the Ghoul. Is it based on reality? You get the full story, and it's interesting enough. It's an obvious ending, and a lot of it just kind of feels drawn out. But maybe it should be drawn out just to look at that gorgeous gorgeous Francisco Francavilla artwork. So all in all, I liked Night of the Ghoul. It didn't hit me as much as I wanted it to, but I did still enjoy it. And I'm excited for eventually when they do that movie or whatever. Also from Dark Horse, we have The Ones, number two, a Brian Michael Bendis book about every chosen one in the world. And there's one that's kind of like the Golden Child. There's one that's kind of like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. There's one that's like Neo from The Matrix, right? So there's all these different, um, you know, tropey, kind of ideas of, of the chosen one in, in fiction, and they all have to be banded together to fight Satan. But in the first issue, at the end, they choose not to, and then chaos ensues, so now they're trying to pull it back together. Is Brian Michael Bendis, but it actually worked for me. I thought it was actually pretty charming, kind of cute, pretty fun. I thought it had a nice flow to it. I liked the characters we were being introduced to, and I thought it did a better job of issue number one of setting up more of the world, but we did need that issue number one. That being said, I liked this book. I'm going to continue to read it. Then from American Mythology, we have Silent Night, Deadly Night, issue number one, because tis the season. Um, I love the Silent Night, Deadly Night movie, the first one. Second one, I get why people like it, but half that movie's just clips from the first movie, and that still just kind of bothers me. On Dylan's Horror Show, we're going to be covering part three, four, and five 
like in a couple weeks. And it'll be the first time I watch any of those. I've never seen those. But I love the first movie. And this one is kind of like... I don't know if it's the original writers. I think it might be the original writers that are doing this. Because there's this whole bit at the end. Anyway, this is kind of like their version of a sequel. So it explores some of the things that they would do if they were doing the sequel and not just the cash grab that did give us the awesome garbage day bit and all that stuff. I get it, y'all. I just... You can't watch that movie too closely after watching the first one. But I love Silent Night, Deadly Night. I'm not saying this was a fantastic comic, but I thought it was better than the Fright Night one, and I thought it was pretty interesting, and I did enjoy it. But it is not the most well-executed book, but it was good for me. And then we were shorted the photo cover, but I got that on the way. Don't worry about me. Then we got The Firstborns. It's a new one from Sumerian. My buddy likes to point this out. So when this went from Behemoth Publishing to Sumerian... The, the, the paper quality just got to all kinds of just shit, to be honest with you. Uh, this story is interesting. It's decent. It seems it's from the people that did Purple Oblivion. And the art seems like it's art, the kind of artist from Heavy Metal Drummer. I don't remember that one, who that, who that artist was. But I loved the art in this one. It was hard for me to pick up on most of a story. It was interesting enough, though, that maybe to read it again. But this quality is getting really, really bad from them. Really bad. From Vault Comics, we have Hard Eyes issue number four. Issue three started to lose me a little bit. Issue four, though, was the revelatory issue that pulled me back in. It's like Al Pacino said in Godfather 3. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Love the artwork in this book, by the way. This artist is going places. This art is absolutely amazing. From the figure drawings, the perspective, the landscapes, the technology, drawn everything, and great color choices, too. That's the Banez and Diaz. Really good stuff. Yeah, Victor Abanez and KG Diaz. Freaking amazing artwork. Holy cow. That stuff is amazing. I like the story. Like I said, a revelatory issue where you understand more of what's going on. Then we have End After End number four. This is from David Andre, uh, Tim Daniel, uh, Sinundo C, Kurt Michael Russell, and Jim Campbell. This was my favorite issue of End, a uh, end After End yet. So it's about... When you die, you go to this war zone place where you're just caught in this like fantasy war, right? So it's kind of speaking on war, but more about having something to fight for. But in this one, we're getting more revelations about our character, about his hopes and his dreams. We met him at the end of those hopes and dreams. And so now in the afterlife, he's getting to rediscover that and find faith and find something worth fighting for. And I really like it. So the structure of this whole series so far has been really good at bringing you along with it. I cannot wait to see where that goes. So that's what I read, that's what I thought, but I do wanna point out real quick that the Savage Dragon Ultimate Collection Volume 1 is here from Eric Larson. If you've ever wanted to get into Savage Dragon, you have to dig into dollar bins, but even that ain't gonna get you too far because eventually not so many copies of Savage Dragon are out there and they start getting a little bit pricey. So. Now we've got these nice definitive hardcover collections coming out and they are very, very nice. A really great representation of the artwork, great paper quality and lots of bonus features packed in the back. Lots of cool sketches, uh, thumbnails, process, his colors process, everything. It's every freaking thing that you would want is there because Eric Larson keeps like all that stuff, right? So this is the way to do. It is $40 and what you get in this one is the first three issue miniseries, the five issue The Dragon miniseries, and then the eight issues, the first eight issues of Savage Dragon. And they're gonna continue doing these and I hope they, they like do as many as it takes because this comic rocks. And I just got into it for the first time this year. So for 30 years, I was being a fool. So anyway, that's what I read. That's what I thought about it. End after end, best issue yet. Heart Eyes, amazing art there. First Firstborn's interesting, but nah, it's all right. Silent Night, Deadly Night, a must for fans. The One's pretty solid. I like that one. Night of the Ghoul, disappointing in the ending, but love the artwork. It's only Teenage Wasteland. Loved it. That's your sleeper pick of the week right there. Behold Behemoth, more action-packed than the first issue, but still very captivating. Know your station. Really like the world building here and love the art from Liana. Frank Miller presents Pandora. Didn't really work for me. Dark Crisis War Zones, non-essential. Gotham City Year One, best issue of that one yet. Poison Ivy, 
I'm liking this series a lot. Sword of Azrael, the best John Paul Valley we've ever gotten. Thank you, Dan Waters. The Joker can't justify a $6 price tag. Can't do it. Batman and the Joker, though. Deadly Duo with art. Amazing artwork from Mark Silvestri for five. I can get behind that. Batman, one thirty. A little cheap on the ending and kind of obnoxiously preposterous in the first third. Gargoyles. Perfect for fans of Gargoyles. You definitely want to get in on that. Spider-Man. Don't like Spider-Man stuff. Kind of getting out of it. Daredevil. Loving this kind of slow burn into epic quality. Then we got Punisher. One of Marvel's best books on the shelves. Fantastic Four. Two issues in. I'm sold on this run. Thor. It's interesting. So is this Thanos. But it didn't quite click for me fully. Extreme X-Men. Wasn't for me the first time. Probably won't be for me again. Miles Morales. That's one of the best Marvel number ones. I mean, Marvel's kicking it. With some number ones lately, the Doctor Strange one, but the art in this one, holy cow, y'all. Really good stuff. You definitely want to check that out. Dark Web, eh, it's all right. It's not going to be quiet for me. Kaya was awesome. Spawn was really cool. Bloodstained Teeth was awesome. Little Monsters was awesome. Image is killing it this year. Duo Powerbomb was fantastic. Hexware was okay. And then All Against All. Pick of the Week, loved it. Great concept, amazing art, top-notch lettering, all together the best number one package I got for you this week, and it's the pick of the week. So that's what I'm reading. That's what I'm digging. What are you reading? What are you digging? Let us know in the comments down below. Please be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and join us over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts, blogs, and a whole lot more. I've been rocking Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Station, keep on reading. Pop, pop, boom! <laughs>